So welcome, uh, and thanks for everybody actually uh, being here. I was almost expecting I would be speaking for on, in front of a completely empty room. Uh, lots of people certainly had to catch flights. So, um, so the topic that I'm uh, uh, talking about is up here. It's probably the most descriptive uh, speaker title that you will ever see in the conference. So <laughs> uh, pretty easy to understand what it is about. Uh, first, a few words about the company I'm representing and the product portfolio that we have. So first of all, we're not your usual startup here that you find here. We have been around for quite some time. Um, we actually have products that do workload management for a living for many, many years. Uh, we do service uh, lots of uh, really big companies. Um, uh, typically Fortune 100 companies with some of the biggest clusters that you can find out in the industry. So like 300,000 cores or something like that is not rare. And we have built scheduling uh, solutions for those types of customers for a long time. And uh, actually the part of the product portfolio that we have uh, is for facing uh, Kubernetes is bringing some of the knowledge that we have uh, gathered over the years into that uh, uh, in, in the Kubernetes space. Right? That, so that's part of uh, what we're doing there. Um, just by way of uh, further enforcing that point, uh, so we have customers in pretty much all industries. Um, and as I said, uh, pretty big names uh, doing quite interesting things. So they usually their uh, value generation chain starts with our product where we manage their workloads and uh, uh, it's absolutely critical that our stuff runs their stuff. They have pretty complex uh, requirements, and uh, so we have lots of experience with scheduling, workload management, etc. Now, uh, switching over to the product that we provide for uh, Kubernetes, uh, the product family is called NavOps. It does a number of things. Uh, the key point is that we're trying to help you make use of your Kubernetes cluster as good as possible, meaning getting the most out of it. Um, that entails things like uh, manage resource scarcity, um, uh, allowing you to run multiple tenants on the same Kubernetes clusters without them stepping on each other's toes. Uh, running mixed workloads uh, that is containerized and non-containerized. And part of it is also, uh, as we will see in this talk, uh, Mesos frameworks. So running that all on the same Kubernetes cluster. Uh, we also support things like application workflows, where you basically have dependencies within your application workflow uh, so that you run you know, step one, phase one of your application, then phase two. So things like that we all uh, provide solutions for. Um, one of our core products, which is called uh, NavOps Command, which provides this uh, virtual multi-tenancy that I mentioned um, from an architecture point of view, the way how it works is uh, that we basically have implemented a scheduler uh, that is compliant with uh, the Kubernetes scheduler interface. So it can be used as a sec second scheduler next to uh, the Kubernetes stock scheduler and can be used by the workloads. And it provides a lot of functionality on top of uh, what the stock scheduler uh, provides. Uh, to give you a little bit more insight in that architecture. Um, so it's actually running as a pod itself on uh, top of Kubernetes. It uh, talks directly to the Kubernetes API server. Um, so from a end user point of view, you see no difference. You just use your kube control to submit your work. Uh, but our system actually uh, gets to know which uh, pods it is supposed to be scheduling and uh, has its own internal um, uh, persisting and so on. Um, and of course, the scheduling component that decides where pods are running. It updates the API server just like the stock scheduler is doing it. Um, for the administrator, there is an additional line of interfaces if you want to configure the policy. Uh, but that's only for the policy configuration. So we have a REST API, web UI, and of course, uh, also a CLI. The types of uh, policies that we provide, uh, you can see here on this uh, picture. So there is things like uh, workload isolation. So for instance, runtime quotas or access restrictions, 
workflow management, I have mentioned that already. Uh, we can affiliate workloads with things like owners, projects, uh, application profiles, and inflict policy on uh, workloads that have a certain affiliation. Then we have uh, node selection criteria, for instance, maximize utilization. So as opposed to just doing uh, spread or pack, we actually look at the resource consumption and place uh, uh, workloads where there is uh, the best use of resources, basically, for these workloads. And then the most important thing is workload priority. Um, so we do uh, provide many ways of actually uh, putting priority on your workloads and then make decisions where to put them uh, based on that priority. And uh, a pretty important one of those is what we call proportional shares. I have a picture of that here. So uh, with proportional shares, you can subdivide your Kubernetes cluster in different partitions. And uh, each of that partition presents a, uh, represents a percentage of uh, how much of the resources this uh, uh, partition should consume. So here, for instance, I have you know, production, development, and some batch workloads. And uh, you can break that up hierarchically. Um, so for instance, under development, you have backend and frontend development, which share the slice that the development uh, department has uh, received. And really, our policy automatically makes sure that you get that amount of uh, resources over a certain period of time. If one of the departments doesn't use up their resources, then the others can share it. But um, if uh, they come back, then of course they get uh, their fair share of, of what they're requiring. So finally, uh, in that context, uh, from a general point of view, uh, regarding the capabilities that we bring to Kubernetes, I've talked to a couple of them, like for instance, this advanced multi-tenancy that I just had in the previous slide, or uh, the best fit scheduling. Um, some more things that we do are, for instance, uh, automatic eviction. So if, uh, you know, parts, for instance, if, if some of the uh, departments that I've mentioned don't get their fair share of uh, resources and others get too much, then we will automatically evict replicas to get the right balance. Um, so things like that. Uh, one more thing that I've mentioned already is mixed workloads. Uh, so from a mixed workload point of view, what we can provide is, for instance, that you actually run non-containerized workload together with a uh, containerized workload next to, uh, in, the, in the same uh, Kubernetes cluster. We do that by deploying a workflow management system that is part of our product portfolio um, that handles uh, uh, non-containerized workloads, and we have containerized that as basically a uh, workflow management service inside of uh, Kubernetes. Um, and you see that here on the picture to the left, which is called Univa Grid Engine. So now switching over to uh, the universal resource broker, so really the topic of the talk. Uh, so what is Universal Resource Broker? It's, uh, first of all, open source. It is an uh, um, implementation of a Mesos-compatible resource uh, broker. It allows you to run uh, Mesos frameworks uh, really seamlessly on uh, Kubernetes cluster. Uh, so what can you do with it? So first of all, you can share resources across Mesos frameworks and uh, standard Kubernetes applications. Obviously, that helps you uh, to reduce cost because you do not need to run multiple clusters, let's say a Mesos cluster next to a Kubernetes cluster. It also simplifies cluster administration and uh, management. So again, if you had two types of environments, you would actually need uh, two types of yeah, knowledge in, in order to run your cluster, two types of uh, monitoring and so on. Uh, so if you used, for instance, the Mesosphere uh, Kubernetes uh, um, implementation where you run you know, Mesos as your basic infrastructure and then Kubernetes as uh, a, uh, uh, a framework inside, then you still need to know how do I manage Kubernetes, how do I manage Mesos. That's not necessary here in this context. Your pane of class, your single pane of class is Kubernetes. Um, it helps you, obviously, if you want to transition from Mesos to Kubernetes, then uh, that is a viable option. Let's say you, you have some frameworks that you still want to use for at least some time. 
uh, then it's very easy to do that with uh, URB. Uh, from an overall uh, you know, arch architecture point of view, what it looks like is simply you have your shared uh, uh, Kubernetes cluster. And then uh, on some part of it, you run your standard uh, Kubernetes workloads. And on another part of it, you run your uh, Mesos frameworks. And the Mesos frameworks really that are run there or the instances, the replicas, they just show up as regular Kubernetes pods. So um, from a management point of view, from a point of view of like monitoring, diagnostics, and so on, you can use all the tool set that is available in Kubernetes. You really don't need to uh, uh, worry about doing something different there. Uh, and also from the uh, Mesos framework point of view, they don't even notice that they don't run under uh, Mesos. They you know, just think they, they are running under Mesos control. A few technical details. Um, so how is it actually being done? Uh, so we have implemented a uh, shared C++ library that pretty much uh, re-implements the uh, C++ library that Mesos comes with. So it implements the Mesos binary interface. Uh, we also have uh, provided a JNI uh, wrapper so that you can have uh, your Java-based uh, frameworks uh, talking to this, and then a Python wrapper, again, for uh, Python-based frameworks. We're currently working on the HTTP uh, frameworks. Um, the system itself is uh, a uh, master broker service, which is a Python daemon and is event-driven uh, through G-Event. Uh, on the back of it, there is a Redis-based uh, message bus. Um, there are actually multiple implementation of backends for uh, URB. One is for Kubernetes, and the other one is for the other product uh, that we sell, which is Univa Grid Engine. Um, so these are just more or less uh, uh, possible implementations, you could add further implementations if you had yet another uh, orchestration system, then it would be possible to add those as well. If you want to, wanted to get started with URB, wanted to take a look uh, how it works on, or test it, it's uh, totally freely available on GitHub, it's a Apache license. Um, if you look at uh, github.com, Univa Corporation, then what you will uh, see is basically three repositories. One is called URB Core, which contains the core implementation of URB itself, and then the adapters, uh, one being URB uh, uh, Kubernetes, and then URB uh, Grid Engine. And it comes, of course, with some README, with uh, uh, some uh, examples like Marathon, Spark, and so on. Now, over to doing a little demo. I do not believe in uh, reliable networks at conferences, so apologies that I have canned this demo and I'm just playing it. Uh, but it's really a live demo that I've just recorded, and in, in some cases I've sp sped it up a little bit to uh, reduce the waiting time. So what I've set up here is uh, just a uh, Kubernetes cluster on GKE, uh, simply two nodes. Uh, that's all that you see running here. And then I have uh, a number of things uh, running. If you uh, look down, you have this watch command, uh, as you can see, and it just filters out the uh, cube system stuff. So I have uh, uh, test dev jobs uh, for backend and uh, frontend project. And then I have some uh, uh, production jobs. Again, I have some backend and frontend controllers running. And down at the bottom, you see uh, several uh, UR in the URB namespace. So I have URB itself, then uh, Marathon, Spark, and also um, Kronos. So you see this proportional share uh, thing again. I'll just show you quickly how that part of our product portfolio works. As I've already explained, I have split, split out the total uh, Kubernetes resource pool here in uh, Mesos, CI, and Prod. And now I'm, I'm switching between uh, backend and frontend test jobs. So basically, I'm giving frontend uh, project more resources. And you can actually see this here, how more and more frontend test jobs are running. Previously, it was five to five. 
I have a ma set a maximum of 10, so it was 5 to 5. Now it is more or less 8 to 2. Now switching to uh, uh, Kubernetes, so, uh, sorry, to uh, uh, Mesos. So here I have the standard Marathon interface, and I'm creating an application. Uh, so pretty simple application here in this case, just simply a sleeper. I give this some uh, CPU fractions and then uh, five instances and uh, the earth shattering command sleep 30. So creating this here then. So as you see, the system is functional. Um, I'll speed this up a little bit. I remember this takes some time. So what you already can see down here then, uh, if you look at the URB uh, pods, there, is, there was already the executor, the marathon executor. Now if we uh, look over, then we see those, uh, there are five staged. Now switching back, you see the five uh, pods being running. And uh, they switch from staged to running. So, okay. So you saw those marathon jobs coming to run, so I'm, I'm just deleting them. And the uh, next thing that I'm uh, uh, doing here is uh, Kronos. Again, just a simple uh, Kronos test job, so creating a new job. Again, uh, some sleeper job, nothing exciting here. Uh, just a sleep command, in this case, sleep 20 seconds. And I'm going to start that job every 30 seconds. So the intended behavior is a uh, job, when it started, runs for 20 seconds, then it finishes, and after 10 seconds, we should see uh, another job being started. So looking over at uh, the cube control side, uh, you can already see a Kronos uh, uh, job being running, which I've highlighted here. And if you uh, look for a while, so after roughly 20 seconds, it should actually uh, uh, be terminating, so it's gone now. Now it's gone, actually. And then when we wait 10 seconds, uh, there should be the next job showing up. Here it is. And from the uh, uh, Kronos side, I mean, if you look at the uh, status information that Kronos provides, then you can see you know, the schedule and uh, what the runtime percentages was. So that's it for that simple demo here. I could actually have run also Spark, but Spark takes relatively long to uh, launch jobs, so I didn't want you to uh, look at uh, paint drying on a wall until that happens. So to wrap things up, um, in general, what we try to do with uh, NavOps is uh, uh, allow you to put just simply more or allow you to run more things on a uh, uh, Kubernetes environment, and uh, specifically uh, also mixed workloads, so workloads that are non-containerized or workloads uh, like the Mesos frameworks, and also do that in a fashion that they don't step on each other's toes so that you don't have conflicts, which you then have to go in manually and, uh, you know, uh, uh, rescale uh, things, but instead you can use high-level policies that uh, set the goals on how you want the resources being utilized and then NavOps command automatically uh, implements this. If you have questions, uh, feel free to ask now or find us at our booth. Uh, you can also visit uh, two websites. So for the NavOps product suite, it's navops.io, or for the company in general, univa.com, and here is my email address. Any questions?
Yeah, so uh, um, first of all, the Mesos framework has to be containerized in this case, right? So in this case, we don't uh, uh, support non-containerized, but containerized frameworks. Uh, we currently do not support HTTP. We're working on that. So HTTP frameworks wouldn't work right now. Um, from a hardware uh, point of view, good question regarding GPUs. I mean, we have, uh, as a company, lots of uh, experience with GPUs. We actually run some of the most advanced GPU uh, or machine learning environments in the world, but with our other products, with our more technical computing facing products. Uh, but it would be interesting to uh, see how that works in the Kubernetes context. That's actually something that we have not tried yet. So the question was how the migration process would look like if you have like a Mesos cluster and you wanted to migrate things over to uh, 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 Kubernetes. Um, so I mean, one option is obviously you, you shut things down, right? And then you start them up in Kubernetes, but that would involve some downtime. I think in theory, it actually should be possible uh, although I, I will admit we haven't tried that, but it should be possible that you just uh, create a, uh, um, uh, your framework in Kubernetes parallel to the Mesos framework, and then you put some uh, load balancer in front and you know, just point them over, and as soon as you're happy with what, what's going on in, in uh, uh, Kubernetes, on the Kubernetes side, you shut down the, the Mesos cluster. I, I see no reason why that shouldn't work. Any more questions? Doesn't seem to be the case. Okay, thanks for uh, uh, coming out here. And again, if you have follow-on questions, uh, find us at our booth or uh, drop me an email. Thanks again.